Well, definitely want to thank Mary for asking me to speak here today. And my talk that I'm going to be having today is about low vision solutions, getting the most out of your vision. And as she said, I'm a low vision optometrist. And what some of you might not know is how uh, Dr. Yoganathan is moving from Toronto to Windsor. Windsor is my hometown. I was born in Windsor. I actually practiced there for 13 years. You're going to love it there. Um, but I've actually now been practicing here in Toronto now for 10 years. And I focus my practice on helping people who have vision loss see better by maximizing the vision that they still have so they can see um, to do the things that are most important to them. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. So I'm sure that many of you, let's see, can remember that day that you were actually sitting in the eye doctor's room. It could have been your optometrist or the ophthalmologist. And there you were because you noticed that there was a decrease in your vision. And the doctor has just finished up doing the examination, the assessment, and the doctor says to you, the reason that you've been experiencing that decrease in vision is that you actually have this eye condition. And it could be macular degeneration, it could be diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, or any other eye condition that affects the vision. And as those words were being said to you, I'm sure that some of you just kind of remember even going almost blank. Because all of a sudden, you had all these questions that were being, might, might have been spinning in your mind, thinking, am I going to go blind? Will I be able to drive again? Will I be able to read? Will I be able to see the faces of my loved ones? And the great thing is we just got to listen to some of the great advancements that Dr. Yoganathan was actually talking about with the advancements of vision research and with the stem cells and the gene therapy. And... Where it, it, the advancements have been really impressive, especially in the last 15 years. But you sitting in that chair, or you sitting here in this room, you want to maybe think about, well, what can we do about the vision I have now? And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about. And when it comes to talking about um, vision loss, there are so many different faces to vision loss. And it could be that it's someone who's born with it, so an infant. It could be that someone develops it in their early um, first decade of life or second decade of life. It could be in, in their uh, middle age. Or I like to say, um, once you've had many, many birthdays and you're very, very wise, um, it could happen later on in life. And how there are many different faces to vision loss, there's also various solutions that might be out there. And what might help somebody who has exact same condition as you may not be the right solution for you yourself. So that's something we have to think about when we talk about um, seeing what might be the best aid for you. So what are the solutions that are available? Well, when you go in to see a low vision specialist like myself, um, what we focus on is how can we maximize that intact vision that you still have? Because commonly, when you have macular degeneration, it affects that central area, the part responsible for the finest detailed vision. So being able to see the details of someone's face, being able to recognize signs, um, be able to read. So that part gets damaged, but that peripheral vision is still intact, and that's what we're focusing on. How can we maximize that intact vision? Now, if you have glaucoma, or it could be that um, someone younger might have retinitis pigmentosa, it's more tunneling of the field of vision. So the peripheral vision's affected, but centrally, they may have more vision there. So we focus on how can we maximize the vision there? And the tricky part is if it's more tunneled, is if we maximize and magnify things, well, it might fall out of their field of vision. So we have to be cautious on how much we maximize or magnify, and it might be more that you may need more contrast or look at something where the print is white on black, where you don't need more magnification, but you just need a different contrast. And that's what we do when we assess our patients. And so I'm going to let you know how a low vision examination 
what to expect if you were to have a low vision assessment. So I'm going to kind of go step, to, uh, step by step with it. And the first part is really determining the vision goals of that person. And it's really a customized recipe because when I'm doing the assessment, if someone tells me they were never much of a reader, I'm not going to be focusing on various magnifying aids and digital magnifiers that would help them to read if that's not what's important to them. Now, they may still need to know um, that when they go to the store to be able to see a price tag, so maybe a simple magnifier is what they still need. And so once we know the person's vision goals, it's really the vision goals that we commonly hear is near. They want to be able to see the newspaper, read books, read the mail as it comes in, or it's actually being able to see the medication bottle or labels or price tags on there in the store. When it comes to distance viewing, what's often most important is to see the faces of their loved ones or to be able to watch TV or even enjoy a live event, especially if they used to like to go to the theater, be able to go back and watch something uh, as a live event and see what's happening on the stage, or go to a sporting event, especially if anyone has tickets to the Raptors, that's the hottest thing in town right now, to be able to see them, you know, win, um, win the, the championships, because they could possibly do it this year. Uh, we're rooting for the Raptors indeed. Now the other part that we also address is glare. And many people think when we talk about glare, it's that of the sunlight outdoors. So that's one aspect. But it's also the indoor lighting as well that can make a difference. And now we also are looking a lot at various screens, be it a computer screen, an iPad, or a smartphone. So it's also the glare off the computer screens or any of these devices that we have to address as well. Now, I have, for those who can't see my slide, I have a picture of a dog wearing really, really thick glasses because one of the things patients always ask is, can't you just make my glasses stronger? And I let you know the foundation of a low vision assessment is definitely determining what can we do with eyeglasses first. But when we talk about making glasses stronger, when it comes to distance, by making it stronger doesn't necessarily make it better. And the analogy I usually use with my patients is like going up a mountain. When you're at that top of the mountain, that's the best possible vision. And if we just make the glasses stronger than that best part, it now makes you go downhill. It blurs up your vision. Now, there are ways of tweaking the prescription in the distance, especially if somebody has a macular defect. And that's what I do or my colleagues do if they're seeing someone with low vision. And it's not something that's often done in a routine eye examination if you see a regular optometrist. But what we do is we may tweak a prescription by introducing something called a prism. And the purpose of the prism is to shift optically the way the light enters the eye. So instead of hitting you right in the center at the macula as your glasses are supposed to do, we shift the focal point to an area adjacent to the macula if it makes that difference. So that way we can optimize the vision still optically with glasses. So I said when it came to distance, we can't make it stronger. However, when it comes to reading, we can. And so the stronger we make the glasses for reading, it does mean that now you have to hold the reading material closer and closer. Not everybody wants to hold the reading material just a few inches away from their face. And in that case, we're not then going to give you the stronger glasses. We'll still give you that reading power that we need where we can give you a, a fair distance away. But then know that you'll have to rely on additional aid, be it a traditional magnifier or what I'm going to talk quite a bit about are even the new electronic digital magnifiers that really make a huge difference. When it comes to the glare cutting, many of you might have those fit over glasses that you've picked up, which helps shield the sunlight not only from the top but also from the side because glaring, uh, the glare from sunlight can be very bothersome, not only directly looking at the sun, but it's actually the stray light that still gets through the glasses. So the fit overs help block that and many patients do quite well with that. And there's different colored lenses and I'll talk to you about that briefly as well in a moment. 
What also has been new is actually new blue blocking coatings. And you might have heard about this if you've gotten glasses more recently. And these coatings, it's actually a coating put on your prescription lens. And it either comes as being a virtually clear coating or one that has a little bit of a tint. And what they do is they bl block out the blue wavelengths of light that can cause more glare at that macular level. And the reason that they've come up with these clearer versions is that back over a decade ago, they realized that people who are actually having a lot of glare issues off the computer, it was actually from the blue wavelengths of light or the blue light coming off the screen that was causing some of the computer strain and glare. Now, patients didn't want to be wearing, or people didn't want to come to work wearing yellow or orange tinted blue blocking lenses if they had healthy eyes. So the manufacturers have been trying to create blue blocking lenses that are not the traditional yellow and orange lenses, so they can wear it more in the mainstream. It doesn't quite cut 100%, but is actually fairly close. And some people respond well. And even my low vision patients who before might have liked the yellow and orange see a benefit with the ones that are lighter colored. And traditionally, what we would show people are what's called the Corning lenses. And what's special about the Corning lenses, some of you may have these, is that they actually cut out the blue wavelengths of light at various points of the spectrum. And so some of you might have the yellow tinted lens, and the yellow lens cuts it out at 450 nanometers. If we go into the orange colors, it cuts it out even more. But the Corning lenses, what's unique about them is that they're actually photochromatic. Uh, if you do get the photochromatic version, which means indoors, it has that certain colored tint that you see when you get the glasses. But when you're outside exposed to the UV light, it actually darkens up. And many people find that that helps. It doesn't just help with the glare, but it helps with contrast as well. And I find many patients who are walking, they often find it's difficult to tell objects that are very similar in color where the edging might be. And a perfect example is walking on the sidewalk. And here in Toronto, we have a lot of uneven sidewalks. So often these corning lenses give you a little bit better definition of where the sidewalks are butting together and give you a little bit of perspective that it might be one more elevated than the other. So a big thing that we're always looking for is making sure that when you have vision loss, we're trying to provide safer solutions, especially when you're navigating, because we don't want you tripping and falling. And when it comes to macular degeneration, often the yellow or the lighter orange lenses are the best. Other conditions seem to prefer some of the darker ones. And we do have samples at the booth, and it's very simple. You just hold it in front. If you notice a difference and you like it, then you know that you're actually sensitive to the blue wavelengths of light. So after I've done everything with glasses, I then show magnifying aids. And I'll show the traditional magnifiers first, because that's what people are familiar with. And I'm a big fan, if you have macular degeneration and many other eye conditions, to have a magnifier that has a built-in light. Because we do know that good lighting can make a tremendous difference when it comes to reading. And sometimes just by bringing a good task light onto a page, even without using a magnifying aid, can improve your vision by a line or two or sitting by a window if the glare is not a problem. You might find when you're sitting and there's natural sunlight coming in, you see better than when it's a cloudy day. So I'll first show the traditional magnifiers. Limitations that we have is that we, the higher of a power we go in traditional magnifiers, you're only seeing maybe two or three words at a time. And if it's a handheld magnifier that you have, it was never designed to read newspaper or books for extended periods of time because your arm gets tired, you start to shake, the words jump up and down. And if you have arthritis, it's even worse often as well. What I get excited about, and anyone who's heard me speak, is I'm always really excited about what's happening with technology and with the new digital reading aids that are out there. There are some that are smaller and portable that you can put into a purse or a pocket. Others are a little bit medium size, and some now are, are larger. And what's really specific about these that get, give you more benefit than a traditional magnifier is that you can vary the contrast on it. So often, if you're looking at the paper, it's very poor quality. You're looking at different shades of gray against a washed out background. With a digital magnifier, you can actually make the print look darker black on white. You can make it white on black. 
if you like the yellow, you can do black on yellow, yellow on black. But you can also vary the magnification because one thing that you'll notice when you have vision loss and you have an eye condition, you can have good days and bad days. Very common that you can find that your vision fluctuates. So when you're having a bad day, a digital magnifier allows you to increase the magnification if you need to, whereas a traditional magnifier doesn't. And one of my favorite ones I actually have up here is one that was actually released last year. And the reason it's one of my favorite is that, one, it's portable. It weighs 2.2 pounds. I'm holding it in my hand here. So think of it like a laptop. It's 12-inch screen, so it's a larger screen than the smaller ones. And so if I actually put it onto a page, and I'm just going to capture an image because I it would be a little bit easier this way if I just take a photograph of it. So I've actually captured an image from a traditional paperback book. And I'm able to actually capture the whole page. And what's unique about this one is, like I said, you can change the contrast to the different shades. And with that as well, I can make the print much bigger if need be. I can make it smaller. There's actually buttons on the side that I can actually move the print so it's actually doing a dynamic scrolling side to side. And this is a unit that also does up and down. But I like it even more because it's also a touch screen that I can actually use my fingers. And if it's a bigger magnification, I can move as I'm reading. Because the number one complaint I would have from my patients who were avid readers is with any of the smaller magnifiers, they're only seeing two, three, or four words at a time. And if they were avid readers, it slowed them right down. Because avid readers are usually quick readers. And it was so frustrating. They felt like they were back in grade school learning to read. And that's not how they wanted to read. And the other thing that's unique about this one, you can actually connect it onto a bigger monitor, and this acts as a camera, like a big CCTV, but you put it onto your monitor. And if it's somebody um, who might still be working or goes to meetings like this, so if just you being in, in the audience, you can actually connect a regular camcorder that you buy at Best Buy, and it doesn't have to be super expensive. Attach it with the HDMI cable into this, have it focused on my PowerPoint, and that PowerPoint would be shown on the screen. But if you needed to look at a, at a handout that was on the table, you can press a button to toggle back to the reading and then go back to looking at what's on the screen all within this device. So it's a pretty impressive aid that way. The other ones are your... Um, New, the CCTVs, which have been around for decades, and I know that uh, Lorna has one here from the OCAD, the Vision Technology Services, and you can put a book underneath. So these, I always like to say, are the Lexus of, Lexus of reading machines because you can put a book underneath. It can magnify up to 85 times, where the one I showed you is 22 times. Now, I'll let you know, 85 times is really ideal only if you're a coin collector or a stamp collector. You're never going to use it at 85 times. But it gives you that bigger feel. The issue, though, is that these weigh about 45 pounds. So once you have it put positioned somewhere, you're not picking it up and leaving and moving. Whereas the one I just showed you, you could take it to a cottage. Or if you're traveling to another city, you take it with you. And they even have adapters. So if you're going overseas, you can still plug it in and use the device. But there's also optical character recognition scanners. There's computer software programs that you can also get as well. The next part after I've done the near is I look at distance viewing aids. And there have been various aids over the years that are spectacle mounted or headborne mounted. The one that I really like right now that's a very simple device is the one that I actually have here in front. And I'll describe it to you for all of the, everyone who can't see it. It's actually a mini pair of binoculars. It's 2.2 times. And it's designed as a clip. And then with it being as a clip, you can easily clip it onto your eyeglass frame and wear it to watch TV, look at faces. Depending on your vision, you can use it to look at the PowerPoint here in the room where you're sitting. Go to a live theater event and see the stage come to you. 
and it's designed that you could flip it up out of the way because when you use a telescopic or binocular aid that's spectacle mounted, remember you're not supposed to be using it as you're walking looking through the aid because it's going to magnify that floor. You're going to feel that the floor is a lot closer and you can easily trip and fall. So for that purpose they designed it that you can easily flip it up out of the way to get the regular perspective but when you need more magnification you flip it down and it's in place. And this is something you can easily switch between your regular glasses and you can also put it onto your sunglasses as well if need be. I have a picture of one of my patients who he gave her this solution and she was so excited to be able to see the faces of her family again. And she had like the yellow lens, so I actually got her a custom-made magnetic clip-on that we were able to put onto her glasses so when she wanted it yellow, she could. She also had the traditional sunglass polarizing clip that already came with the frame, and then she had this telescopic clip. So we made her glasses, one pair, be multifunctional by adding these different clips on. And then, as I said, I get excited about new technology. And I have a picture here of the eSight eyewear. So um, we have the representatives of the eSight here at, the, at, the, um, at one of the booths. I also carry uh, the eSight as well, the eSight 3. And what this, how this is unique compared to everything else I've talked about is when we talk about this kind of device, it allows you to see distance, intermediate, and up close, all with one unit whereas the telescopic clip I showed you is only for distance. The digital reading magnifier is only for reading. So you have to have more than one tool to be able to do the various things. And so this is like wearing a, a pair of virtual glasses that have little screens on the inside and it transmits whatever you're looking at onto that screen. And if you're needing to use that white on black or the yellow on black or black on yellow, it gives you those modes for reading that you can do that. It also gives you the feature that you can connect an HDMI cable into the unit if it's connected to your TV or to your iPhone or iPad and you can stream the videos right into the actual glasses. And by doing that, you're taking away an extra interface so you actually get extra clarity that way. And it even can do some optical character recognition of reading some text to speech as well. Another one I have here is Iris Vision, and this one is actually a Samsung phone that's been put into a virtual reality headgear with specialized app, and so it actually acts as a digital um, uh, viewing aid for distance, intermediate, and near. The next one I'm going to talk about is OrCam, and OrCam is one that I've been involved with and watching ever since 2013 when I was putting together a presentation for a conference I was going to speak down in the States, and the product wasn't even available in North America at the time. It came to North America in 2015. It's a technology from Israel, and it came to Canada in 2016, and the first rendition had a wire and it had a little box that you had to um, keep around your waist, which was like a little computer. And what I have here is actually right now with me is the portable newer version, which is a wireless version. And I'm just turning it on. And you would actually attach it with a magnetic clip onto the glasses. So I do have another demo frame that has that magnetic clip. And what a person would do is they would put the glasses they would be wearing their regular glasses that have a little ma magnetic adapter piece. They'd attach the OrCam on it with a magnet. And what's special about it is they can actually pick up the newspaper. They can pick up a book. And if they're looking at text, in a few seconds, it'll actually capture the picture. Ironically, it is my passion for the game of hockey that has kept me from writing the perfect hockey song for the band. My so hopefully you can hear it's reading back the page. Now I can make it stop by holding my hand in front, making the stop sign, and that gesture it recognizes it means stop talking. If I look down at my wrist, the time is 1.26 p.m. Today is Wednesday, May 29, 2019. 
So it can tell you the time, the date. You can save up to 100 known faces. And so when that person's in front, if they've been saved, it does facial recognition. And it will actually say that person's name. And if you go to the store, it can actually read barcodes to you. It, they have up to 4 million universal barcodes now saved into it. So you pick up a pa package with a barcode, you look at it. If it's one of the saved uh, barcodes, it would actually tell you what that product is. And if it doesn't know the barcode, then you just look at the package. If it's text to print there, it'd be able to read it back or tell you the nutritional information. It can also read signs in the distance. So last fall when I was at the Vision Quest, I was standing back at the pillar here where this carpet ends with the, the ceramic tile, standing all the way back there. There was a, one of the research scientists was speaking here at the podium. He had his presentation over here at the PowerPoint. And right by that pillar, I was able to have the Oracam read back what was on the PowerPoint because it was big enough that it could actually identify. So it's not just reading things up close, but things in the distance as well. So that's where I find it's such an impressive device of what it can do. And I refer to it as being an intuitive camera system that you'd be wearing. And here's one of my patients who was um, doing a demo with it in the office that was using the device. And this is actually the picture. So it was actually not at a sales rep at the time was standing next to me and she had it on. And that's a picture being here where she was reading that PowerPoint that was actually from that distance, which was quite a fair distance. And you can tell the PowerPoint, it wasn't a large print. It was actually decent size and it could pick it up. Another one I want to mention is IRA, and I didn't realize that IRA would have a booth here today. So this is a new technology that actually, it's a paid service where you could use either specialized glasses that have a camera mounted, or you could use the camera off your cell phone with the app that's, that you download. And you, when you have the app on, or you're using these glasses and it's on, you're connected to somebody that's actually working for IRA, and you have a profile set up. So they'll know if you like to have information told to you very detailed or not. And so you actually, it's a paid service where they give you X amount of minutes in, in the month. And you can actually access that camera and a live assistant is there helping you. So this is handy, especially if, you know, you don't have family members who can help you or you don't want to wait until somebody is there able to tell you something. You can just navigate on your own and it gives you that independence where you're hooked up or you have access to somebody 24-7 who could be of assistance to you. And when we talk about the smartphone, I always like to say that's been the most revolutionary advancement since Braille. And Braille this year turned 200 years of age. And when we talk about apps with these phones, there are so many various apps out there. And it can be bombarding uh, or, or overwhelming with so much information. One of the ones I often tell my patients about is one by the Braille Institute called Via B. It's a free app. And what I like about this app is that it gives you a summary of various apps that people who are visually impaired or blind have actually kind of given their feedback. And you can actually even um, look for different apps based on categories to help you out. So it could be that you're wanting something that can help you identify colors. So you could put it there and it'll give you a list of various apps that might be friendly with your phone for someone visually impaired or blind to be able to use. Another one that I just, um, on the bottom, I had actually a link to a website. It's called Apple Viz, so www.appleevis.com. And this is a great source if you actually have an iPhone or an iPad. And they actually give you information about various apps that are really good if you have vision impairments or blindness as well. Another one is Be My Eyes. So Be My Eyes is similar to the IRA it, app, but it's actually a free one. And these are actually just volunteers who are willing to help. So the last time I looked, I think they have about 180,000 registered users who are visually impaired and blind, but about a million people who are willing to volunteer to help you out. So there are people out there just wanting to help and, and be your eyes if need be for some of those tasks. It could be that something gets shipped to you by mail and you don't know what, what it is. They could actually, with a camera, tell you what it is, or you might be out at a 
out in the, the store. And you're looking at the expiration date on the milk carton and you can't see it and you don't want to ask someone in the store. You could have someone tell you going through this app. Another one is Seeing AI, and this is from Microsoft. It's a free app. And the developer of this, it, he is completely blind. He's lo lost his vision in childhood. And it's using artificial intelligence. So it can read things back to you by holding the phone over a sheet. Um, there's uh, facial recognition abilities as well. So it's an impressive device. It has some of the similar ideas as the OrCam, but it doesn't rely on any kind of cell phone. For some people, they have found that it drains a battery really quickly. What I often tell some of my patients who are still working or they're in school, the difference between the OrCam and the Seeing AI, if you're working in a bank, government, insurance companies, privacy is a very big issue. So something like the Seeing AI app, they don't allow you to use because you can retain that information. Whereas with the OrCam, once it reads something back, you cannot retrieve it for later. So same thing, a student doing an exam, they can't take those questions afterwards and share it with students. Another one is Tap Tap C, and again, you can hold it in front of something and it'll identify some products of what it might be. It's a free app. This is an interesting area. It's actually where it uses echocollation and ultrasonic detection. And this is very handy for someone who has had, has limited vision um, from glaucoma, retinitis pigmentosa, optic nerve damage, or using a white cane. Someone who's used a white cane can often attest that they've bumped their head many a times. It could have been a hanging basket or a cabinet door was left open. So what this is, one of them is called the Sunu Band. You wear it as almost like a, a wrist watch and it has a little detector on the edge. And it'll pick up if there is actually an object within a certain distance away. And the closer you're getting to the object, even if it's overhead or to the side, it starts vibrating faster and faster, warning you that there might be something that you might bump into. To. And the other one is a buzz clip where you can actually clip it onto your clothing or you can hang it around um, a lanyard around your neck or you can also attach it onto your white cane with an adapter piece and again it detects and there's a vibration letting you know if you're getting closer to an object. Many people now have these voice activated assistants. Um, if you don't have it, maybe a family member has it. These are our Google Home, um, the Alexa, the Amazon Echo. And what these are, they're great for people who have vision loss. Because you could say, hey, Google, tell me the time. Hey, Google, what's the weather today? Um, or we were using it the other day when we weren't able to watch the Raptors because we don't have cable in our home. Um, we were listening, and it would actually tell us what the score was and what part they were in the, uh, the period of, of the game. So there's different things that you can use. You can have it play music for you if you want to hear relaxing music. And so I want to definitely mention that a lot of these solutions I've shown you may look different. It's not necessarily regular glasses like what you're accustomed to. But if it helps you see, I want you to think about this could be a possible option. And the solutions, like I said, may not be the glasses, regular glasses, but if it's helping you see the family, your faces of your loved ones, that can make a world of difference for someone who might be living with vision loss. And in summary, definitely know that help is available. And other areas of resources, as I said, if you haven't had a low vision assessment in the past, you might want to consider seeing who provides the services in your community in the area. Um, so contact a, a low vision specialist like myself. Um, the CNIB has great services, and they now have also the Vision Loss Rehab of Ontario, a chapter of them. Um, there is Balance for Blind Adults. It's, a, uh, agents, uh, it's a, an office that they have here in the West End that does some amazing uh, services, has some great workshops. There's a Vision Institute. We have also the great work that Fighting Blindness Canada, and I had to pause because I've known you guys forever as Foundation Fighting Blindness, but I've worked on it. Fighting Blindness Canada has done amazing work, and if you're not aware of it, they have been around for 45 years, and they have been the primary supporters and funders of vision research that happens here in Canada. 
and I'm always honored to be here because they definitely have educated, they've done, they do just such a stellar job throughout the year, educating people with vision loss and providing amazing research um, by having the funding um, to bring some of this research to fruition and actually um, to reality. There's also the um, Toronto Visionaries, which is a great chapter from um, uh, the CCB, the Canadian Council for the Blind. And they're a great group that meets once a month formally at the CNIB, but they also have a lot of great outings as well. Because one big thing that often isn't discussed is that um, socializing part when you have vision loss. Many people feel so alone. And if you feel alone and you don't have anyone to talk to, that's where it's easy to fall into a depression. And I'll let you know, Having depression with vision loss and blindness is very common. You're at a six times increased risk of having it. People who are healthy and have their sight go into a depression. It's something that we talk a lot more about. But know to reach out. If you haven't met anybody with vision loss before and you're here, there's many people here in the room that do have vision loss. Talk to them. See how they're doing. When it comes to a vision, a low vision assessment, it is different than a routine eye examination. I usually spend on average about 75 minutes with my patients. It is a specialized exam and OHIP doesn't cover it, but we cover everything that I discussed to make sure we come up with the best possible plan and recommendations of vision solutions that are gonna help you. And as Dr. Nathan had mentioned, um, eating green leafy vegetables, really key. The orange colored vegetables as well. Smoking, we know, can actually put you at an increased risk of developing macular degeneration. If you are outside wearing sunglasses and protective um, uh, a hat as well, can make a difference as well. Taking the multivitamins, if you're not getting in in your diet, uh, with the, the green leafy vegetables and colorful fruits is definitely a good idea as well. One thing I wanted to mention as well is this is a pilot project that I've just uh, been able to develop with the CNIB through the Vision Loss Rehab of Ontario. It's something that's been in the works for a while and we were able to implement it as of this year. And this pilot project allows me that if any of my patients need additional training beyond what we do in the office, I can arrange for a Vision Loss Rehab Ontario worker uh, through the CNIB to go into your home and do additional home training at no charge to you because currently they do have funding from the government and hopefully they're not going to touch it because it was through the Lynn branch of funding um, that the government had done. But this has proved to be really successful. We've had quite a few of my patients go through the program as well and they've really enjoyed having that additional training, especially after they've had a device for two to three weeks to really reinforce the best way to use it so they can do the things that they want to be able to achieve with their aids. Know that you're not alone. Reach out. Um, as I said, there's a lot of great resources. Um, there's also other organizations like the Toronto Trailblazers, which is actually the Tandem Bike Club. There's the in the Ice Owl Hockey that if you're visually impaired and blind, you can play right now with the season getting better and hopefully it warms up. Is Blind sailing is an option. There's curling, there's golfing. So there's a lot of great organizations that have been catered for those with vision loss. And on my website, I have a place that links you to all of these local groups here in Toronto in the GTA. And be an advocate. I'm a huge advocate for um, vision loss and blindness, and that's why I do support Fighting Blindness Canada. And as was previously mentioned, I've been involved with Cycle First Sight. I actually did it for six years on a tandem bike every year. First three years, my partner and I did 140 kilometers. He was completely blind. The last three years I did it, I did it the half distance, which was about 75, 80 kilometers. And my partner um, is a former Paralympian skier, so he's partially sighted. And it's an amazing event. So if you have, if you enjoy cycling, used to enjoy cycling, look into it. They even have distances of 25 kilometers as of this year for those who don't want to do the 50 or the 140. 
And if you have family members who are cyclists, really promote them to actually support the cause and get out there. It's an amazing event. If it wasn't so amazing, I would not have done it for six years because I was, wasn't a cyclist when I first did it. But it was my way of giving back to my patients, and it was also my way of actually being a role model for my kids because if you would have asked me years ago, could I do this? I would have said, no way, I never cycled. But it was a goal that I needed to do the 140. And I'm happy to say I was able to do it. And unfortunately, my kids keep me busy now with lots of activities. And there's a conflict for this year's event, so I won't be able to do it this year. But I'm hoping in a few years to actually do it with my two oldest kids. And um, this is a picture of my kids. I always like to say, everyone deserves to see the beautiful things in life. You won't, some of you won't be able to see, but I have four kids. My oldest daughter is 12 and a half, my next daughter is 11, and I have a twin uh, daughter and a twin son who are eight and a half. So they keep me very, very busy. So thank you so much. Hopefully you've learned quite a bit, and I'm definitely open to any questions that you may have.